Welcome to this 20th session in the series that is being held to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the arrival of Clara in Australia to promote the Baha'i teachings in the Antipodes. That's Australia, New Zealand, and South Pacific. Now, in the first couple of sessions, we learned about Dunn's successful establishment of the Baha'i communities in all Australian states. And uh, we learned about the first generation of the Australian Baha'is uh, who were inspired by the Dunn's example and continued their work of multiplying the number of Baha'i centers around the country, but also uh, strengthening the institutional and administrative uh, foundations of, of the community. Uh, we've observed that in the 1920s, the Baha'i teachings such as the equality of men and women, uh, the equality of races and of all peoples, was quite a, a, a daring and, and, and challenging set of values for Australian society. Um, we've also started to look at the relationship between the Australian Baha'i community and the Iranian Baha'i community. It has always been a close relationship. But because of Australia's uh, immigration policies through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, it was not possible for Iranian Baha'is to migrate to Australia. There's been a, one big difference between our two countries, and that is that in Australia, we've had of belief and association, whereas the Iranian friends were persecuted for holding the very same values that we hold in Australia. So from the 1940s and 50s, many Iranian Baha'i families sought to move to other countries so that their families could prosper and flourish and develop their full capacities. And last week in the 19th session, we heard some stories of those first Persian families that were able to migrate to Australia. Now we continue that theme tonight. The number of Persian Baha'is who arrived in Australia from the 1950s until the uh, Islamic revolution in 1979 has not been calculated, but it, it's surely no more than 100 people. If, if 50 people, okay. the number who arrived after 1980 into the prison, surely more than 5,000. Now, our focus uh, in this series is on just a few families and unfortunate constraint due to time limitations. It doesn't imply that these families had any more important a role uh, and nor are they intended to be representative of the other stories. The best we can say that they are indicative of the experience of the Persian friends who came to Australia. And we hope that uh, our purpose in holding these sessions is to inspire the other families and the friends of those families to, to uh, have them also record the they left Iran and uh, came to Australia. Uh, so this recording is for the benefit of their own families, future generations, but also for, for the broader community who are interested in these stories. And so we get to the uh, session tonight, and I'm going to introduce, as we proceed, uh, I will introduce, and I'm going to start by introducing Cambys. Now, uh, Professor Cambys Mani, together with his wife, Professor Shule Mani, arrived uh, from the United States to New Zealand in 1984, that's some 36 years ago. Uh, but in addition to spending time in New Zealand, Cambys was the foundation chair and professor of systems thinking at the University of Queensland. Mute. Mute. Uh, now, Cambys is the nephew of Hedy Ma'ani, and we're going to hear the story of Hedy tonight. Hedy was instrumental in encouraging Cambys and Shawle to move to New Zealand. So, welcome, Cambys to our session. I hand over to you. We look forward to your presentation. Hello, Apple friends. Uh, kia ora and greetings from Auckland, New Zealand. It's about 9.41 here and uh, it's wonderful to see the faces, most of whom I don't recognize. But it's a pleasure to see a few faces. Uh, Heli and Paide, uh, our colleagues from New Zealand before and a few others. But it's a pleasure to, to meet so many wonderful faces on the, on the screen. Uh, I'm really overwhelmed. Um, 
that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Graham, for organizing this series. Uh, it's a wonderful service. It's a it's historic uh, initiative you are doing this, and I'm sure uh, future generations for, will benefit from that. So tonight, um, Graham has asked me to, to talk about Hedy, and uh, who was uh, my young uncle. And uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to do that. And I'm also, the, the timing is, uh, is, uh, is very <coughs> appropriate because uh, this next week on Tuesday is the 22nd anniversary of Hedy's passing or, or martyrdom in, in New Zealand. So this October is always this week is a special time uh, for us, for the family and friends to remember Hedy. So again, uh, this timing is, uh, is, is perfect for that. Um, I'm not sure where to begin to talk about Hedy and uh, from <coughs> that I mean from the beginning, from his, uh, uh, from his childhood or from the very end, uh, his, uh, his martyrdom and the events that led to that and, and, and beyond that, the, the formation or the, the in initiative of the Race Unity Speech Award, which is going as a national, national project successfully in New Zealand. So, but uh, Graham uh, graciously sent me, uh, we were discussing with, uh, with you, Graham, uh, a website for Hedy because he's, uh, he's a kind of a, an international character. He's, he's not just known in, in New Zealand or Australia. Uh, and I was very surprised after his passing, I was visiting Hong Kong and the US and so many people, they, they came to me and then once they recognized that I'm a relative of Hedy and I started talking about him uh, as, as close friends. So I still don't know how he managed to actually create such a sort of a network as, of, of uh, friends around the world. So uh, it was in connection with this website that Graham sent me a very precious document that, uh, well, I have a copy here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a document that uh, Hedy wrote, uh, but it, he typed uh, in uh, 19, exactly, I don't know the, the date, but the, okay, he, he wrote it for the occasion of the 75th year anniversary of the faith in Australia. And he called this, uh, it's a 20 pages, uh, he called this Baha'is Unite Mankind teaching the faith in Australia, 1963 to 1975, personal uh, recollections. I'm very grateful to this because uh, reading this, I learned so much about Hedy himself. He, as I said, he was a young uncle and uh, although I had uh, little contact with him after he moved, uh, he went overseas for, for a number, for several decades, I was actually not close with him. But uh, I learned about even his childhood in Iran and then his, uh, his travels through Southeast Asia and finally his settlement in, in Australia and eventually in, in New Zealand. Uh, I'm going to read some of the head, headings of these. Uh, so basically it summarizes his journey in, in that first part, which is very interesting. And one of the things I found it most interesting and fascinating was the Baha'is that he mentions here that are that I don't recognize the name. Uh, perhaps one of the names I recognize, and I can see the bright face here, John Walker. He's actually, his <laughs> mentions here, because I know John uh, uh, from previous contacts, but there are a no number of names here that I mentioned there is, and maybe it, uh, you, you remember as Baha'is in Australia, and, and that maybe generates some, some of your memories. So he starts, uh, he was born in 1944, so uh, he would be uh, 70, 77 years had he lived uh, today. And he says he was the, the youngest son of a family of eight, eight brothers, uh, a, a pioneer family. Five, uh, six of the members of the family, they went pioneering during the 10 year crusade. And Hedy was the last one of them, the youngest one. He left Iran uh, right after high school at the age of 18 with uh, two of his friends, uh, uh, Mr. Bezai and Nisagian, that went to Southeast Asia and, uh, and they were able to, to render uh, uh, 
service in, the, in those areas. Uh, he, uh, <coughs> all right, just have to be accurate to this. After spending a year in, uh, in Indonesia, that was his first stop, uh, he, he moves to Melbourne in 1963. In, in Indonesia, he meets Dr. Mohajer, and Dr. Mohajer uh, kindly encourages him, uh, and actually maybe more than encouraging him, he should be a medical doctor. And uh, Dr. Mohajer gives all his medical books to Hedi as part of the encouragement. But Hedi decides to, to study architecture, and uh, so eventually he earns a degree in architecture from the University of Melbourne. But before that, he attends a, a number of uh, colleges. He mentions the name of them. I don't recognize some of these. Uh, and all of these are basically guided by the places he was a uh, pioneer from, from Geelong to, to Perth, to, to Northern Territory, to Darwin, and, and so forth. And uh, he talks about the first Baha'i clubs at the University of Melbourne. He talks about uh, the Tasmanian uh, teaching trips. And, uh, and the name of the young people uh, in Australia. Right here, I, because I'm, I recognize some of these names, uh, I'll mention here. Uh, he says in uh, 16 November 1963, he arrives in Melbourne and he joins a small group of uh, Persian Baha'is, most of whom are young Baha'is whose parents are pioneer in Southeast Asia. He mentions uh, Kamran Eshragian, uh, Farid Peyman, and Bijan Busuk. Again, I only know uh, Dr. Eshragian. And then uh, he talks about meeting Dr. and Mrs. Gabriel, uh, Dr. Handley, uh, Frank and Bibi Khan, which I assume are the parents of uh, Dr. Peter Khan, and uh, Betty Anderson, Gertie and Gerhard uh, Schelster and the um, Blute family Trumans. So uh, does anyone recognize any of these names? Again, you don't look that old, you know, <laughs> some people nod. <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting because uh, for me, it was, uh, it was very interesting to, uh, to, to see the names. And uh, then uh, he, he talks about uh, the, the teaching trips. And so most of it is like a manual. It, it reads like a manual for teaching because it is prescribes what's the best strategies for teaching at that time. And, um, and he also talks about the time that, uh, as uh, Graham mentioned in the 70s, early 70s, uh, a large influx of the Baha'is arrived from Iran. And uh, he talks about the strategies that how should be dispersed to different parts of Australia. And uh, then he, uh, goes on to uh, his return to Melbourne and completing his degrees. And uh, there, is a, there is a section, so each of these are the headings of sections. He talks about love and unity leads to teaching success. So that's, that's the title of a section. Um, and uh, again, details of the Baha'i Club and, and so forth. Uh, he mentions uh, Shirley Charter. So I don't know how many of you know or uh, remember Shirley. I haven't met her. But uh, she is known to New Zealanders as a very audacious teacher, and uh, a section of this um, article is devoted to to Shirley's activities in Australia. Uh, must have visited Australia to to lead some uh, teaching activities. I don't know, Graham. Have you met uh, Shirley? Have you ever? I, I haven't personally, but she's well known in Australia as well. Yeah, she's well known, right? Uh, uh, I have met her. <laughs> John Walker. Right, Rob, wonderful. So uh, I remember when when he was when he was alive, he talked about Shirley for quite a, so he was kind of a role model for him in terms of uh, teaching. And uh, finally, he talks about Alice Springs and teaching the indigenous uh, in, in Australia and then uh, the entry by troops in 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 Alice Springs. Again, it's a it's a fascinating read and. I think it's, uh, it's reflects a part of uh, Baha'i history in Australia from a, a, a young person's perspective. And, and it shows uh, his passion for, for teaching. So, uh, 
That is one of the main things that people recollect when, when they talk about Hedi, Hedi and teaching, because that was his passion, his life's passion, and, and it drove him to do things, and it, it was the main motivating force in his life, not, not his career, not even marriage, not, uh, not accumulating wealth, but, but teaching. And um, to the point that uh, he, in his uh, will and testament, in his will, uh, he writes specifically that uh, the only thing I want on my tombstone is the word Hedimani uh, Baha'i teacher. And uh, so if you visit uh, his tomb in, in, in Auckland, in uh, North Shore Auckland, this is exactly what it says, Hedimani Baha'i teacher. Uh, his, uh, his other passion was uh, was encouraging uh, of the youth and, and, and the indigenous. And he spent a lot of time uh, working with the youth in, in teachings and, and encouraging them to, to, to excel in whatever field uh, they were active in. The, the video I was going to share with you uh, is a part of a, a television program. Um, in New Zealand, we had uh, for many years a program called Baha'i on Air. I'm sure many of you had seen that. Uh, this was uh, uh, it was broadcast every week, and it was produced by uh, uh, by Baha'i Ken Zemke. And uh, some of these uh, episodes have been dedicated to Hedi. And and the video I was going to share is a collage of these videos that features Hedi, and talks about the uh, Race Unity Speech Award. Because uh, this award, again, I don't know how many of the Australian friends are familiar with this uh, Race Unity Speech Award. Uh, it was an initiative by the local spiritual assembly uh, that Hedy was a member of uh, right after his passing in, in Devonport, uh, Auckland. Uh, after his martyrdom, again, that's another long story, but I don't think tonight is the, the appropriate place to, to re <coughs> recall that. Uh, the, the assembly the, the decides to honor, honor him by uh, creating a speech award uh, to, to honor, because Hedy was a, was a great orator, and he also being a great teacher and young, so they, these two, uh, his passion for the youth and, and teaching the indigenous, they created this award uh, for race unity, uh, and then started very, a humble program uh, that uh, initially in Auckland, the three schools participated in that. And now, 19 years later, it's a major event. It's actually a national event that is, uh, is sponsored mostly by New Zealand police financially and also with, uh, with the manpower. Uh, New Zealand police has seconded uh, one of their staff full time during the year to, to work with the Baha'i Office of the External Affairs to work on this. And uh, again, I, some of you might have seen this. Now, the last two years, the winners have appeared on the national television. Uh, they are on the YouTube. So if you if you type in the YouTube uh, Race Unity Speech Award, uh, you will see the samples of the speeches that uh, are they're, they're most moving. And almost every year, uh, maybe, maybe just one or two Baha'i. So, almost 99% of the participants are, are non-Baha'i. So, and these are people from the last year of the high school and encourage that uh, they use Baha'i quotes, they study Baha'i writings and they're inspired by Baha'i writings and they they construct their speeches based on the teachings. And uh, so it's a, one of the most moving and, and effective. So this race unity speech award is, is one of his legacies that uh, has been preserved, you know, by the National S Spiritual Assembly and also now by, by many, many, many sponsors. Uh, I can share a couple of, if I can succeed, uh, Graham, can, I'm going to share. Do you see the screen? Thank you. Uh, Cambys, we see the screen. Okay. So that, that was, uh, this was Hedy, uh, and this, uh, this was the invitation that was produced uh, for the 20th anniversary of his uh, martyrdom, and which was the 13th of October. And uh, following his, uh, his uh, murder in Auckland, 
and after uh, the Universal House of Justice uh, viewed the, the reports of the events as uh, reported by New Zealand police because he was murdered by Maori, uh, the Universal House of Justice uh, wrote this to the, to the New Zealand Baha'i community. The Universal House of Justice has decided that Hedi Mawani should be designated as a martyr to the cause of Baha'u'llah. You are asked to convey this decision to the close relatives of Basir Mawani and to the members of the New Zealand Baha'i community, who will doubtless draw inspiration and new energy in their service to the faith from the fact that this devoted servant of the cause has attained the rank of martyr in your country. That's um, 23rd of June, 1999. And uh, I'd like to share an, uh, another one, if I may. Uh, Do you see the photo? Do you see the photo? No. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is from, yes. Thank you. Okay. Good. I, I did a confirmation. Uh, this is uh, from the last year awards, uh, and this is a deputy chief of police presenting this uh, at one of the colleges. This this particular college in Wellington. Uh, at two winners because there were six categories of winners and each sponsor, uh, each sponsor of these awards has uh, a, a special award uh, designated for that sponsor. And uh, so two of them happen to be in this college. So the, the police uh, uh, actually presented the award to them and uh, on the stage there is a member of the two members of the Baha'i community and uh, the rest are from the school and uh, other representatives. So uh, the Baha'i community, the National Assembly has an award, the, the Hedi Mohani has an award, police has an award, and there are six other, uh, no sorry, four other awards that are each one is named and has a uh, separate designation. And, and uh, this is the, this is the award winner, uh, the girl uh, to the, to the left of the police chief, and um, and some of the participants. So this, um, I go back. I think uh, this basically. Uh, I'm going to go past my time. Uh, it's um, just a snapshot of Hedy's life, a very special life dedicated to to teaching and. Uh, his his uh, his work and everything was 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 an excuse, you know. I did the, the, the shop that he was an architect, as was mentioned. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> barring a few years uh, working for for a for a corporation, he he started his own private business in in uh, in Devonport, uh, one of the suburbs of Auckland. And his shop was basically an outpost for teaching people could stop by Baha'is here and non Baha'is and and it was an excuse and he would just uh, drop everything and, and go if it was called you know to go and visit some of the communities around and uh, so it was uh, he was so dedicated to the indigenous that uh, some of the new zealand evies they, they they actually honored him to be one of his members so they adopted he's that adopted son so to speak of some of the maori tribes in in new zealand so, Graham, I, I stop here, and if there are friends of any recollections or one questions, I'm happy to, to actually entertain those. Cambis, thank you for that brief overview of Hedy's life. Maybe a number of people had not heard of him before, but now they know he was one of the early young Persian men to arrive in Australia, uh, and uh, those who did know him know him as such an active teacher of the faith from those early days through to the end of his life. Thank you for that. And if there are, I think um, it's a chance for people to ask questions uh, to you about Hedy's life, uh, or if somebody has a particular question who knew him, uh, we can devote five minutes to that before we move to the next speaker. Maybe you can describe what led to his martyrdom, if possible. All right, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting story. Uh, as I mentioned, he was very active in teaching the Maoris and 
one of the groups that uh, the largest Maori church in New Zealand is called the Rathna Church. The leader of that church was the contemporary of Abdul Baha. And, and he was advocating the unity of Maoris within the same church. So his main message was also unity. And so that, that brought close affinity with that group and Hedi. So Hedi had a special focus on this group and uh, he was teaching them very actively. He, he, they were in a North Island, a remote part of the North Island. So he would travel regularly to this, uh, to this area, which is called Ratna Pa. It's a kind of village that, uh, that was basically mostly populated by, by this group of Maoris, the, the Ratna people. So he would uh, visit them regularly and he became friends with the president. They called the, the head of their church, the president was a young man and uh, and this man was uh, became uh, very attracted to the faith and that alarmed a number of the members of that uh, the church community and what happened uh, about uh, 11 members of the, the ministers of the church they declared their faith in uh, in, in, in Baha'u'llah and in a very special ceremony they they dropped their robes, you know, the, the official robes of the church. And that was a very significant event that caused uh, some people to be disturbed by this action. So they, they felt threatened by this, that now there are 11 members of their uh, clergy or, or ministers. They have, they have joined the faith. So this alone, and one of them was this young man. Uh, he, he was not well and uh, and then he, he was disturbed by the fact that Hedi was very close to their president, the president of the church. And, and soon after this uh, event, the, the, the clergy become, become behind this group of uh, ministers, the president uh, dies for some reason. He's a young man and uh, I, I still don't know the, the, the causes for his, for his passing. But that, that event, uh, uh, triggers a, a, a very serious uh, sort of a notion in, in this young man's head, you know, that this is actually, he, he, he confesses that to the police, uh, that he, he finds Hedy responsible for the death of his, the president. And, uh, and he, he, he believes that Hedy is going to actually the, end their church, you know, so he's going to actually their church. So he was very worried and uh, during the funeral of this president, Hedy decides to travel to this part of North Island, which is a 10 hour drive. And, and this man who knew Hedy, he asked Hedy to come uh, to, to travel with him. And uh, Hedy accepts to, to, to give him a ride. So he comes to Hedy's home to go together the next day to the funeral of the president. And, uh, and this man at that night, which is a, 13th of October, he, he murders Hedy at his home. Uh, out of rage, you know, uh, that, that, and he finds, and, and later in his uh, police uh, interviews, he confesses that uh, Hedy was antichrist and he was responsible for the death of his president and uh, the, of the church. So, uh, and uh, he also had the name of other prominent Baha'is, you know, that uh, he would he would actually uh, uh, was planning to do similar to the to some members of the National Assembly. So this was the reason that this man that and uh, he, he was imprisoned. He uh, there is no um, sort of a death penalty in New Zealand, so he was imprisoned. Um, but I heard that he he he, he died uh, a few years ago in prison. Uh, Graham, can I ask a question, please? Uh, yes, Bob, go ahead, please. Uh, can I get a copy of that report that that, that man wrote? Uh, uh, do you mean the teaching uh, experiences that can be introduced? Yes, that report, we can get that to everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll send it to the email list. Thank you for that, uh, friends. Uh, if we can thank Cambys for this presentation on Hedy. Obviously, there's so much more to the story, but we've been introduced to it tonight. So, Cambys, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for sharing with us tonight.
Pleasure, and thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you so much. I'd like to move to our second presentation, which is by Arvid Yuganagi, and it's about the Yuganagi family, and a number of the family members are online with us tonight. Arvid has lived in Bendigo for the last 20 years, and he works in senior management at the National Vocational Education Regulator. He says he is one of the oldest of a Persian Pai background to be born in Australia. He spent some of his uh, youth in the Pacific and Eastern Europe. He grew up in Sydney, and he's going to share something of his family background and their experience of Sydney in the 1970s and the 1980s. Arvid, welcome to uh, the evening. And I think I'm sharing your um, presentation and you'll be speaking. Thank you, Graham. Um, uh, welcome to everybody tonight. Um, this is a little bit of sweet revenge for Graham because he's wanted me to write things down for the last 40 years and he's finally got me to the table. Um, so touche for, for Graham. I, I want to acknowledge uh, the fact that we've got um, uh, Tuba Yaganagi Munji with us from India tonight. And I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, some of my community members uh, adopted from Scotland who are joining us tonight as well. Um, Graham, the uh, presentation seems to be a little bit miniature. So do people enlarge it at their end or? Or can you make it larger? Don't know. Anyway. I, I, think, uh, I think we'll have to proceed and uh, okay. people can, uh, hopefully move their own screen, but this is, uh, this is how the PowerPoint comes out. Okay. So, so if I could uh, just briefly talk about uh, a family outline that Graham wanted me to go to with the history, given the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of the Baha'is in Australia. So uh, I did a very, very rough sketch of a family uh, tree on the next slide, Graham. And um, I'll just um, uh, tell the story. The, if you can see the three names at the top, um, you've got Esfandia and Surush, who are two brothers, and they had their nephew, Gustask. And they were in a town called Yazd in the central Iran desert area. And they were of Zoroastrian background, very religious. They encountered persecution. So they traveled across to India as many of them did, worked in the hospitality, worked in the restaurant business. But um, the, the three of them, particularly the two brothers, were very religious. And they were looking for the Shah Bahram, um, the promised one foretold in the Zoroastrian scripture. So in the restaurant, there was a fellow that would come in weekly. His name was Zain Labadin. And he was a very learned uh, person who also spoke Persian, Farsi. And he was able to have weekly classes, uh, particularly with Esfandiyar and Surush, and he would read for them the Masnavi, which was Sufi type writings that uh, was also quoted by Baha'u'llah in the Seven Valleys and Four Valleys to an extent. And whilst they were engaging with uh, Zain Labadin, um, Esfandiyar had a dream that um, on a certain date at noon, um, the Shah Faram would be revealed to him. And on that day, Zain Labadin was reading the, to them a story from the Masnavi, and it was about a group of people that went to the mountains for seven years. And when they came back to the city, their currency was no longer valuable because there had been a new king and uh, the, the, the old money was no longer of any value. And at that time, it was noon. So um, Esfandiyar turns to Zain Labadin and said, well, is there a new currency for today? And he said, yes, there is. And that's when he uh, talked to them about the Baha'i faith for the first time. The two brothers looked at each other and they basically said, Chalo, which was the words that Surush told me in 1986, which means let's do it, let's go. So the two of them, along with their nephew, accepted the, um, uh, the message of the Baha'i faith. Um, uh, and, and that's how that story began. They had a bit of a family conference. They decided that they'll leave their Yazdi name and they turned to the writings and found the name Yaganagi, which means unity. And they wrote to Shoghi Effendi who told them that this is wonderful. And uh, uh, he prays that the family would 
pioneer throughout the, the world. So if you look at them, between the three of them, they had 23 children, which is not a bad effort. Um, so, so with Gustav, um, the nephew, his eldest, starting from the left, is Hedayat, who's my father, Badi, who died as an uh, infant, Neymat, who was um, the first martyr, along with three others of India. Um, Zenat, uh, who went to the United States, but uh, was in Vietnam for some time. And then you've got Anaya, Manira, Parvin, and Sohel, who, who all live in Australia. It's a little bit upsetting that uh, Anaya has only recently died. His funeral was this last Wednesday. So it's a little bit emotional. I don't know if my parents will be able to say too much tonight. They could be feeling a little bit emotional. Um, Espandia in the middle, um, he was a, quite a remarkable fellow. He spent um, uh, some time on the National Assembly in India. And so uh, his children, Bahram, Meru, Gaul, Monire, Rohangiz, Habib, and Bahia. There's a few interesting names there. Bahram was one of the very early uh, Baha'is of Persian extraction to move to Sydney, uh, to, to move to Australia. Uh, Mehru ended up living in Australia. Gaul was an amazing teacher who had trips to Australia. Munira Saheli and uh, Munira Yaganagi, who married uh, Sharful Saheli, um, indications are that they were the first people of a Persian background uh, to move to Australia. And Ruhangiz is the only child of Isfandia that's still alive. And um, she pioneered with her husband, John Mills, to Papua New Guinea. And her son uh, has been a councillor, a Continental Board of Councillor, Jalal Mills, in our region for some time. Habib was also a pioneer in uh, Papua New Guinea as well. So a, a little bit of Antipodan service there. A and Surush, uh, who, who I had the honour of hearing quite a few times talk about Baha'i history, um, his oldest son, Anayat, died a, a few years ago, and he was a, a pioneer and a founding member in uh, Bhutan. Uh, another son was Faraj Faiz, who lives in Laos, um, whose uh, family has done a lot of service there. His wife was the secretary of the National Assembly for some years. His daughters serves on the National Assembly. He's got some children in Australia as well. I think there's a couple in Perth. We've got Tuba, who I welcome, who's online tonight from India. Feels a bit awkward talking about her family and parents. Um, Rotsier, uh, Misarier, Nazanin, and Atapur. So there's quite a few international pioneers and, and services done there. Um, Graham just thought that uh, I spend a few minutes just dotting the I's and crossing a few T's, the people that wondering how the Iganagis fit in um, the scheme of things. So on the next slide, uh, I've got a, a little um, uh, uh, show there of the Safran family. And uh, uh, Firuza there was uh, Gustav's wife, who's my grandmother, and her sister Dolat. Uh, and they were both uh, in Australia for a number of years. Uh, their mother, Holbonu Safran, was a well-known uh, Baha'i teacher in India, and she did make uh, the immemorial section of the Baha'i world. She was a Baha'i of some note. Um, so we've been through uh, Firuzeh's line, but with Dorlat, we've got Mary, uh, who um, married Fussy, and we, the, the Fussy family in Brisbane have served for many years, and they're quite well known. Um, Muni in North Queensland, um, she's done a lot of service, um, particularly with Indigenous people in the north of Queensland, in places like Weeper. We're going to learn a little bit about Hordrat tonight, who died as a young man in 1968. But he actually sponsored um, my parents, Hedaya and Vicky Victoria, to come to Australia. And I think he was the trigger for having uh, many Iranians in that period of time join the faith. He was married to Joan Featherston. And uh, Joan's sister, Mariette, I believe, is with us tonight. Um, Ira is another daughter of uh, Dorlat. She died a couple of months ago. Uh, in the Czech Republic. And um, also we've got Fari, uh, John Walker's wife, uh, who's in Toowoomba, and I believe Fari's with us tonight as well, which is wonderful. So, so Graham, I hope that, uh, that covers everything off <laughs> as far as the family tree goes. Um, so I'll pick up the pace a little bit now. Um, so the, the next slide is just a little bit of fun there. Um, many of those Baha'is from India that came to Australia came on the SS Aransay. And uh, the, that was the 
1967 voyage that my parents took in, and they arrived on the 18th of May, 1967 in Adelaide. And um, so, so back in the day, that was probably the preferred way that people immigrated because uh, of the weight of their, their uh, luggage and belongings. So, so my parents arrived and they were sponsored on an immigration visa by Rodrat Rapemeyer. You had to fill out with the immigration department uh, the paperwork. The SS Aransé was also the same ship that uh, Tony Abbott, former Australian Prime Minister, he and his family came to Australia in 1962 and they would have had a, a similar family unit like that. My, my mother had a two-year-old, she was pregnant, had a two-year-old girl and uh, the journey was a little bit rough on her but I think my father had a good time because the stopover in Colombia, I think he caught a game of cricket in Fremantle, I think he had a bit of a look around so um, that was just a bit of fun there. They, they arrived in Adelaide and uh, just on the next slide, I've just got a picture of some uh, young Adelaide uh, Baha'is there. And you can see if you can make it out, Rodrat is sitting um, down to your right. And there's quite a few other notable uh, Adelaide Baha'is there. You can see um, Farid Paymon, you can see um, uh, a couple of the Ashrahians. So there's a, a little bit of uh, Adelaide view there. I'll just say that um, my parents told me that it was a very happy time. They were in the same community as the Featherstones, and he would give talks about the Guardian, the, the time with him, the passing of the Guardian, the time of the hands, and that was a very um, happy time for them. But unfortunately, in 1968, uh, Rodrat uh, passed away. So uh, that was a little bit upsetting for them. So they moved to uh, Sydney and the National Assembly um, suggested that they uh, move to Ride. Uh, back in those days, there was only one behind Ride and her name was Maria Cox. Um, she had a Russian background. Some of you may know Maria. Um, the Persian Baha'is in Sydney at the time included, uh, as we can see on screen now, uh, Bahram and uh, Moni Yaganagi. And also we had uh, Shapur and Moni Resahaley. Um, Interesting with Bahram and Moni, they had a grocery store in Lane Cove. It didn't go so well. They moved to Mount Druitt. And I remember visiting in Mount Druitt, particularly with my grandmother, Firuza Yaganagi. And we would, there were a lot of people on the streets back in those days. And I'd be walking with her, with some other relatives, and we would be handing out pamphlets and teaching. Um, they lived, I think, 3 Fiji Avenue in Mount Druitt. And uh, we just walked and uh, that there was a uh, street teaching was what the term they, they used in those days. So that was a little bit of fun there. Um, on the next slide, we can see the Sahelis with, um, uh, we can see the Sahelis there. You've got Ursula and Nigel Hall. You've got Mr. Stevenson. Um, and that's, uh, you can see Shapur and uh, Monire Saheli there. And, some of the ladies on the left, you may have to help me out there, Graham. I, my, my memory doesn't go back that well. <laughs> That's okay, Ovid, we'll keep, we'll keep going. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the next slide uh, is also an interesting one. Um, you've got, uh, at the front, you've got um, Sohail Yaganagi. Uh, I can see Nabil Fussy to the right, uh, beside Sohail, I can see Ruhi Sarushi there. Um, to the right of Sahel, I can see Shapur Saheli with Moniz Res Saheli behind him. Um, at the back row, I can see Anaya Yaganagi next to Rumi Fussy. I think that's a young Anthony Vojkovic standing there. And uh, I think there's a couple of uh, girls in the choir, some of the Salter ladies there as well. Um, so in the next slide, that's the first local assembly of the Baha'is of Ride. And I'll just go through, there's uh, Monire Yaganagi, just top row from left to right, Maria Cox, Firuze Yaganagi, Reg Markham, um, Dorlat, Ma, Victoria Yaganagi. Uh, sitting down from left to right, you've got um, Ruhi Sarushi, Anai Yaganagi, and Heather Yaganagi. So they, the, the family joined between 68 to 70, and they helped form the, the local assembly there. Uh, Mark Towers would visit, and we've already had discussions in the past 
um, Sydney every now and then. There was a two month period he was there and every Thursday night for that two month period, uh, he, he would come and give uh, firesides in Ryde. Probably the most uh, regular speaker was Shafal Saheli. And people from those days would tell me that he was a master of prophecy and a very, very articulate and eloquent speaker. Uh, Beverly uh, Stafford and her family with Paul, uh, they spent uh, a year or so in Ride. And um, we remember Beverly as a very profound administrator of the faith. She was the secretary of the National Assembly for some of the years when the Persian influx came in. But Beverly was quite close to my grandmother, Firuze, and they would organize um, street teaching on Friday nights. I can remember coming home from school, getting in the car, going to the station, uh, and being outside the Sydney Town Hall um, with Beverly and my grandmother handing out pamphlets, uh, little blue and, um, blue and white pamphlet, the Baha'i Faith. Some of you may recall that. So that, that was interesting. Uh, Greta Lake, some of you may know her. She served on the National Assembly for a little while. She took a lot of interest in the Persian families, and she lived on the other side of Sydney in Sutherland. Uh, she would occasionally come uh, once every month or so and run a fireside and uh, she'd often stay the night um, with us and uh, just talk to us and uh, it was her way of having some pastoral care and she also took interest in the children. She would organise little uh, camps for children, children's classes. Um, she was one of those uh, ladies along with her husband Orb. I know Graham's got some stories of Orb as well but they did quite uh, service. Um, Tulane Road was somewhere where we'd go quite often uh, and Sunday nights there were musical firesides and I can remember Fiona McDonald singing at some of those but uh, uh, Tulane Road was significant because the Baha'is would gather there. I got to know the Zanes, the Podgers, the Grants and the Hassles so, uh, and the Sales and what have you. So it was an interesting time there. Around 1970, Victoria Vicky oh, got homesick and went for a visit in Iran. And when she was in Iran, a interesting thing happened um, through a neutral relative. She got introduced to Dr. Mahajer. And Dr. Mahajer mentioned to Vicky that, look, Shoghi Effendi's letters were very, very emphatic about getting Baha'is out of Iran. And they're not going to go to Africa. They're not going to go to Indonesia at least have them go to Australia or New Zealand where they can do some service. Um, Vicky inquired, you don't think that those uh, letters were <laughs> metaphoric or about spiritual tests? Mahadeo was quite emphatic saying, no, this stuff's going to happen. So um, talk to the friends about moving to Australia. So she traveled to about five centers in Iran, but mainly it was in Tehran where she um, uh, uh, talked to the friends about uh, uh, coming across to Australia and she kept in touch with them. There was a little story which I won't go to but she had some trouble getting out of Iran and Australia didn't have an embassy. Um, there was an official there, uh, his name was uh, Peter Noonan and he was um, the 2IC to the Australian ambassador at the time, his name was Barry Hall and they worked very hard to allow her to leave the country and join her husband in Australia some of the issues were that they didn't have a marriage certificate that they accepted because it was Indian, not um, Iranian. And also they wouldn't let her leave with their son because he didn't have Iranian papers because I, uh, I was born in um, Australia. So uh, Australia didn't have an embassy. So Comran Samini um, in Indonesia, he went to great lengths to assist uh, Vicky at the time. So I've put a little uh, slide up, just acknowledging Comron. He spent some years in Southeast Asia. He served on the national, um, on the regional assembly of Southeast Asia. He was a linguist. He uh, was one of the officials at the embassy in Jakarta, and uh, he helped a lot of Persians uh, facilitating their travel to Australia, uh, given his role there. He was unfortunately later martyred uh, uh, in the 80s. Uh, being a member of the National Assembly of Iran. Um, so the next slide just shows uh, uh, him there with Dr. Mahajer, who was living in the Mentawai, 
islands there with a, a paymon or two. And uh, that was um, uh, Komar and Samimi went back uh, after that. So I'll just leave that slide up for a moment and talk about what happened. When Hedayat came back, uh, uh, when Vicky came back to Australia, they started to sponsor other Baha'is. And many Baha'is came to Australia through this um, initiative that Dr. Mahaja had worked on with, with Vicky. So they sponsored the Forghani family, the Hesaramiri family that we're going to hear from, uh, the Verdad Haggis, the Mohibis, the Martins. So people that went to Brisbane and Darwin, uh, Abu Parbar, Samimi, Derakshans. So quite a few friends in Brisbane and Sydney had come through this little um, action. And uh, families uh, such as the Forghanis and uh, the Hesaramiris, they and others, they sponsored many others. So the, the numbers were growing at that time, pre-revolution, uh, because of this. Mr. Mahaja um, did visit again in 1974. And he caught up with Vicky and said, what's uh, the, the status? And Vicky said, look, uh, they're getting their lives together, were not regarded as pioneers in Australia because it was never a pioneering post. Um, and, and he wasn't very, very happy with this, Dr. Mahaja. So what he did is he asked Vicky and Firuze, and they got Mrs. Hesaramiri involved. He said, you're going to cook for everybody. And the next day, we're going to invite all the Persians in ACT and New South Wales for, for lunch and dinner. So they cooked all night and the next day, I remember seeing Vicky, my grandmother and Mrs. Hesaramiri with big pots in the kitchen and around about um, 50 Persians and about 20 or so uh, non-Persians uh, rolled in and uh, Mr. Mahaja was just telling them that they haven't come here for the, he used the words of which means the good water and the good environment but he said, you've come here to serve. And he said, my heart, you're all pioneers. So he, it was a very strong call for action. And as a child, I was just amazed that this one individual had so much energy to encourage uh, the number of people he did. It was a simple direct message, but uh, he said it very emphatically. So that was interesting. Uh, the, the next slide's just a couple of some conferences. And you could see that, uh, that there were some Persian smattered amongst uh, Australians there in the front. I can see the Stevensons, Tim Sale back there. Um, I see Firuze and Munira Yaganagi uh, back in the row. Uh, further back, I see John and Furry Walker. And way at the back, I can see Violette uh, Mojgani, uh, later to become Brentnell. So the, the conferences had a little bit of a different flavor. And in the next slide, you can see there, um, Firuze and Vicky standing there. I, I see Anne Hinton there, Colin Brest, Don Peterson at the back. I see uh, uh, Bob Manell, a, a young Jamila at the front. Uh, I'm not sure, but is that one of the Dima boys at the right? Could be. But um, so, so it was uh, very, very few Persians at the time, as Graham said. We would have been lucky to have had uh, 100 all up. Um, so I'll just go to the next slide. And, and you can see that was the visit of uh, Dr. Mahaja. He was obviously meeting with other people and other committees at that time. Uh, the, the next slide will just be um, Yerenbul. And I can see Vahid Master uh, from the left, my sister Elizabeth, Corin Podger next. And I think that's Kat Podger to, to Corin's left. Uh, and she later was a member of the National Assembly of Australia. Um, the next slide, um, the next slide, thanks for that, Kate. <laughs> uh, the, the next slide shows um, what youth and pre youth activities were like. They were typically at Yerenbull, and um, I've got five minutes, I think, uh, Graham, to wind all this up. The, the person who was doing a lot of this activity was a girl to the right. Her name was Shahid Badian. I can see Tim Sale in there. I'm standing towards the middle there. I see the Blomleys there, some of the Scott people there. She took a particular interest in uh, the pre-youth and youth. And unfortunately, she tragically died at the end of a, a conference in 1980. 
And the community was very grieved by that, but um, her father um, was uh, played an interesting role. And the next slide shows a, uh, a, a Balcombe Hills uh, community gathering, and you can see her father uh, sitting at the front. If we go to the next slide, Graham. Right. So, so what um, her father Anush Badion did is he spoke to the junior youth, and he wanted to know what we did. He wanted to know what the activities were. He, I think, he spoke to myself, to my sister Elizabeth, to Furuzan and uh, Hesar Amiri, and to Kamran Mojgani. And we told them about the classes and the lessons she would run. So what he did is he organised um, for the next five what was happening. Um, if you could just point out Anush in the uh, front row there. Um, and you can see the Safa Jews there, uh, Furuhanis uh, and what have you. What was very interesting is that we had um, meetings every Saturday night for the next five years. And the speakers that we had were just amazing. We had Tom Price, Philip Hinton, James Heggie on multiple occasions, Hands of the Course, Collis Featherston, Hugo Giacchieri, Frank Kahn, his, uh, uh, Peter Kahn, Thelma Perks, Ray Meyer, Greater Lake, Viva Rodwell, Paul and Beverly Stafford, Alan Waters, um, Aaron Blomley. Um, but we even had Graham Hassel a number of times and Graham made the point that uh, uh, we should learn about the Duns and uh, he also made the point that we should write down what we're doing because one day people may want to know about it. And little did I know 40 years later, he'd be the one who would uh, make us write things down and want to know. But um, they were wonderful activities that we had. And that became the center of activity for the Baha'i youth from about 80 to 85. And when that was winding down because Hamid and Bedard were leaving and uh, the Badions were moving to Haifa, Anush and Hamed spoke to my sister Elizabeth and I to say, you need to keep this going. So what we did is that we had monthly meetings on a Saturday uh, in our home. And that became the center of uh, Baha'i activities for the next six or seven years for the youth. And again, we had people like Collis and Peter Kahn and others that would join us. Um, so one, one remarkable guy was Joe Salter, if you could point him out. Um, he, he would have uh, these monthly parties on a Friday night in his home, and he would make sure that every single Persian around in the 70s would, would come. Uh, he's the guy in the um, uh, Hawaiian shirt in the back row, bigger than life, very hospitable, lovely man. Um, so so, so uh, in winding up, I'll just say that when the revolution happened in Iran and the number of the Persian friends were coming. Uh, Vicky served on the National Persian Affairs Committee and worked very closely with Bahe Furhani to direct the Persians to uh, uh, distribute uh, across the various suburbs and localities uh, of Sydney and New South Wales as well, well as they can. And because they were very unfamiliar with the administration for all those years in Iran, they were also uh, briefing them on those aspects as well. So D Dr. Forghani was a great help to uh, Vicky in, in assisting. And there was also involvement from people like Judy Hassel, Beverly Stafford, Ray Meyer, and uh, John Walker when he would be in Sydney uh, for, for, for those type of activities. Uh, I'll wind it up there, Graham. Um, and I think there's one more slide, which is another uh, Persian gathering, but uh, that'll do. Arvid, that was tremendous. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's see if there's any uh, questions for Arvid uh, before we move on. Uh, I find incredible. Uh, so is that John and Fari going to speak? Yes, Fari, Fari. Good on you, Fari. Let's hear from you. Okay, John. I just want to thank Arvid so much. He blasts from our past. All the young people there, we were having a good time teaching the faith. And when I first arrived to Australia in Adelaide, Ovid was a baby. Look at him now. <laughs> Thanks for embarrassing me. Love you, Auntie Fari. Love you too. Can't wait to see. It was so nice, Ovid. Oh. 
Thank you so much for the past. Oh, it was beautiful. Oh, love it. Thank you. Arvid, it's nice to know that you are a Yazdi ancestry. <laughs> you have a Yazdi ancestry, like a lot of Yazdis. <laughs> yes, I think so. Uh, Arvid, you have a number of other family members online tonight, and this is a lovely chance for us to hear from them as well. I wonder if anybody would like to add to Arvid's story. Well, Alaba friends, I'm from India, Tuba Yaganagi, from the Surush Yaganagi family. And uh, very, very proud to be a Yaganagi. And after hearing how the Yaganagi settled in Australia, it is most incredible that the, the work they have done there, especially our Firuza auntie who, is, who, who also went to Fiji. Yeah. And also Fari's mother, she was, they were all very active Baha'is in India too. And then they later decided to, to move to Australia. So the, these families have a great history in India too. The Rapaima family and the Firuza Yaganegi family. And uh, well, the, and the, when, you, when you join all the families together, the Yaganegis, they're spread all over the world today. And our parents were always interested that we yeah. children go out pioneering. So I think 100% all the children went out pioneering. This is um, incredible. Thank you so much, Arvid. It's wonderful to have you, um, Auntie Tuba. And it was maybe remiss of me not to mention the fact that Thiruza Yaganagi uh, was a pioneer um, to uh, Goa and uh, yeah. became a Knight of Baha'u'llah for that service. Yeah. Yes. She was a very great teacher of the faith. Very. Her whole life she dedicated to teaching. Tuba, can you hear me? Yes, Fari. Oh, Tuba, why don't you come here and say hello? We haven't seen you. <laughs> come on down. <laughs> I don't know. Let's go. Um, God willing. <laughs> could I just get something in here? Uh, yes, so we have uh, Verona Lucas is online from Fiji, and so she has some stories to share with us. I have a lot of stories. Peruzi came to Fiji after the dedication of the House of Worship in uh, Samoa. Yuhia Kanum asked her to keep coming to Fiji to teach the Indians here. And towards uh, the end of her time, she's finding it very difficult. Avid came with her. So I have a photograph of him picking me up, carrying me off. So do you remember that, Avid? <laughs> so yes, we had a wonderful time with, uh, with Feruzi and she, is the, she was the Yaganagi that we knew, really knew very, very well. They were marvelous days, Veronica. Well, thank you to Tuba coming in from India and thanks to Verona for speaking from Fiji. I, I think that Mrs. Yaganagi, we use Mama Yaganagi, Firuza Yaganagi, needs her own session one evening to hear her story. Uh, so we look forward to that on another occasion. Uh, but uh, 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 Vicky and Hadayat, you're online there. I wonder if you want to share anything with us. It's up to you, but I uh, would love to hear from you if you can. I, I am Nazani Yaganagi, daughter of Firuza Yaganagi and Sus Tuba's younger sister. I live in Dubai oh, no. and my heartfelt condolences to all the family. Very sorry about that. Fari, I know you, but you don't know me. <laughs> I was the youngest. We always used to spend the holidays in National Hotel. It was such a fantastic holiday for us. Every year we used to visit National Hotel. Oh, that's so nice. And I remember your mother Dolly very well too. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so you, you are here? Where are you now? I am in Dubai. Dubai. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, Tuba's younger sister. Sister, yes. You and Tuba should pop in, say hello. We are quite old now, you know. <laughs> oh, aeroplane can take you, doesn't matter. <laughs> no, my, uh, my daughter's there in Australia. Are they? She's in, uh, yeah, she's in Melbourne. Melbourne, oh, yes. Okay. Her name is Verity. She's married to Human Sobhani. Verity, yes. Oh, okay. I must remember that. Okay. Oh, well, that's nice. Okay. Thank you, Nazanin, for joining us from Dubai. That's so wonderful. That's nice. uh, Thank Vicky, you. 
Vicky, do you have anything you, I think you're going to share something with us. I'm just going to say, Mama, you're going to get, uh, during her life mm -hmm. in Australia, she went to Fiji for 81 times. Mm -hmm. And many people became Baha'is in Fiji. Mm -hmm. That's all I just going to say. She okay. loved Fiji and the people there. She really did. Thank you. I think, uh, um, you I think Abhi didn't mention that Mama Yiganagi was involved in uh, in seventies with teaching the Chinese in Cabramatta. There was a Baha'i center, and a lot of us Persians uh, with uh, Mama Yiganagi were trying to teach the Chinese that were students here, you know, in Sydney. Thank you, for that, Mama. And look, Arvid, so I want to thank you on behalf of everybody who's in the session. Thank you so much for that wonderful overview of your background and your own experiences in the 70s and 80s. And we hope you can continue that and share more with us in the future. So thank you so much. And we're going to move now to our third uh, family for the evening, and it's the Fulgani family. And we have Fawad and Shirley online with us. Fawad's in Queensland, Shirley's in the ACT. And uh, they are going to speak about their wonderful parents, Dr. Bahi Fagani and Nuri Fagani. So over to Fawad and Shirley for your presentation. Thanks, Graham. Um, let me, can you hear me all right, everyone? Yes, we can hear you. Let me share the screen with you guys. Um, yeah, it's just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to see so many people as part of the history of me growing up. And some of you who are listening remember telling me off as a young boy, a young, young youth. Um, so thank you. But this is the family. This is Bahar Nuri, myself and Shole. He came to Australia. Um, just a bit of origins. Mum's family became Barbies after a visit from Tahara to their village near Ghazvin. And my great uncle my, told me that they were, they went and heard Tahara speak and the whole village became a Baha'i, Barbies those days. So from that side of the family, we go back to the uh, Tahara's time. My dad's father, however, became a Baha'i in Tabriz. Um, don't know the circumstances, um, but I know that my grandmother from dad's side was from Georgia in Russia, and she was a Baha'i in, in Georgia. Um, in 10 year crusade, my parents took us, Shola, myself, and my grandmother, uh, Aziza, to Denmark uh, as part of the pioneering. Uh, they wanted to go to Indonesia, but it didn't happen. So they went to Denmark instead in the 10 year crusade, and dad served on the, I think, the first National Assembly of Denmark and had the bounty of being at the election of the first Universal House of Justice. Um, but after three years of not being able to work and other, other issues, we went to Spain for a year and spent some time with my older uncle there and then went back to Iran in 1964. Uh, by the way, Shola, jump in anytime you want. Um, my mom, for those of you who knew her, I, I can see Vicky, you and Vicky, you're gonna give, you knew mom and she was a very restless woman. She didn't like Iran at all. And um, so they applied to go to Canada. And I'm going to let Ovid mentioned that just a minute ago, Vicky came to Tehran and talked to my parents and encouraged them to come to Australia. So then they applied for Australia and we got a, approval from the government after some time. So we finally arrived in Sydney in late November, 71. Um, in those days, it wasn't as easy as hop on a plane and travel from Tehran straight to Sydney. Uh, so we had to do many stopovers. So we flew to Delhi first. And on arrival, we went to the Baha'i Center in Delhi and Dr. Mahaji was there. And he said, no, you're not standing in Delhi. He put us on a bus and sent us somewhere, travel teaching inside India for four days, um, which was a, I couldn't speak English, Dad could speak English and mom a little bit, but Sean and I obviously couldn't speak much of English. Uh, and I remember being amazed that you could openly teach the faith, having come from Iran where you wouldn't dare talk about the faith that openly. Um, that was my first experience of, wow, we can actually tell people we're Baha'is and talk about, and dad spoke at the university in, in India somewhere, I can't remember where it was now. So then we flew to Hong Kong, a couple of nights there, and in 21st of November in 1971, arrived in Sydney. 
and went straight to Esharamiri's home because they're my cousins, fame and the family. And um, they were in top right, so we moved in with them, settled in top right, at, and as I mentioned, top, the right assembly. And I went to high school there, Melbourne High School, with no English at all. Um, I, I remember very, this is the level of English we had those days when we arrived in Australia. I remember my mum asked me to go and get milk from Woolworths. And as those of you who speak Farsi, you know that milk in Farsi is sheer, but sheer is also means lion. So I went to Woolworths and asked the lady there, do you have any lion? And of course she looked at me in a weird fashion, that what the hell are you talking about? So I said, lion, she goes, no lions here. So this went on for, and then she, asked, she took my hand, it was a you know, middle-aged lady, for me it was old woman at the time. And she took my hand and walked me around the shop to actually said, lion, there, lion. She goes, no, that's milk, not a lion. So that's how I learned English in, uh, in Australia in those early days. Um, and having been in Iran and, and being a junior youth and having difficulties, it was a very liberating feeling when we arrived in Australia. And you could tell people at school that you're a Baha'i and you could talk to other people about the Baha'i faith. It, I, I still remember to this day that feeling of feeling, oh my God, I'm, a, I'm liberal, I'm liberated. I can, it's a free country. This is one of my earliest memories of Australia because we arrived here on no, the end of November. And um, it was an evening, we said, oops, sorry, ascension of um, Abdul Baha and we said, that the temple was lit up and we could go there for a session. And as we drove up, coming around the corner, those of you who experienced it, you laugh at me now, it was amazing feeling to see that temple lit up like that and arriving there to say some prayers without the Baha'is in so open, such an open environment. So as you can see in the early days, um, we met some friends in Australia. The Hassel family adopted us. David and Judy and Graham and Jane adopted our Fogani family and taught us the way of Australian culture. And I guess this is something we, don't, we didn't do in the later stage of arrival of, of other people, other Iranians into the country. Um, and there were the Badiyan family, as you can see there, uh, Hanum Badiyan and Mum. And then there was Judy and, and Eric stuck into that photo somehow, I don't know why. Um, but this was the, the people who we met in the early stages. I remember going to the first summer school in Australia. That was December 71 or January 72. I can't remember now, but, and we met hand of the course fellows then there. And uh, obviously as Iranian who just arrived to meet a hand of the course, it was like, oh my God, you know, it was just overwhelming. And he gently took us aside and talked to us. And he said to me, uh, to my dad and I, that it was it very humorously said that I have told the House of Justice I'm not going to Iran unless they give me a bodyguard because the Iranian friends attacked the hands of the cause, you know, and wanted to touch you and all that. Uh, and then he said, after a while, he said that he went, when he first went to Haifa and met the Guardian, the Guardian greeted him and had said to him, would you mind if I greet you as an like Iranian custom? And Hand of course, Handel Course Ferguson had said yes. And the Guardian had kissed him on each cheek. So then he turned around to me and said, Fahad, <clears throat> would you mind if I greet you like an Iranian? And then he kissed me on both cheeks. And of course, for a young Iranian boy just arrived from Iran, Hand of the Course kissing you on both cheeks, it was like, I'm not gonna wash my face ever again. It was just walking around like, woohoo, you know, I'm feeling six foot tall. I'm only five foot six, for those of you who haven't met me. So this was the first impressions of being in Australia and feeling that feeling of freedom and, and how precious the faith was. And then, of course, Graham is fully, don't hide your head for it, Graham. Graham is fully responsible for these, of teaching you about cricket. And to this day, I love watching a cricket game over five days. And, and he took me to my first rugby league game. And... Uh, and uh, made me a Parramatta supporter to this date. Um, so it, this was, I'm not kidding, this was part of being inducted into the Australian culture. And David is online, I know that. And they, David and Judy really look after us and 
it was a proper induction into the Baha'i, into Australian culture and Australian community. So we learn how to eat a meat pie without dripping it and all that sort of stuff. Baha'i community was, was very small, and, and, and Avid talked about it, and I remember, I, you know, when Kambis was talking about um, Hedi, I remember being at conferences with Hedi. Those days, the conferences were, were small, and everyone came from everywhere, so we knew everyone, and it was a real feeling of family. We all felt like one big family, and if someone was in trouble, we all felt that trouble, um, and I, I remember clearly wanting to work and my dad said, no, you're not working, study. And Judy talked to my parents and said, listen, this is Australia. This is Australian way of life. People, you know, young people do these things. So then my dad allowed me to go and work uh, during the school breaks. So, but this, this honestly was a real introduction for us into Australia and making us feel welcome and part of this wonderful community in those days. Um, and I remember sitting up, with Graham watching all night, the ashes from London. Um, remember last time Bashir and Mona talked about the Baha'i culture, that the Gabriels had brought them up in a Baha'i culture, not in a Iranian culture. And I, I guess in those days when the Baha'is from Iran came to Australia, we learned that it's the Baha'i culture that unites us, not our national culture. Um, so it was very, again, a different way of looking at the faith and learning from the Australian Baha'i community. Friday nights was spent at the Hassels near the University of New South Wales. Um, by the way, David was a lecturer at the time. He, he, he lectured me at the University of New South Wales. Um, and I'm pretty sure to this day that he marked me harder than anybody else because he knew me. But maybe he can dispute that afterwards. But <laughs> Um, but we were there, we were at the, at the Hassel's home every Friday night at the fireside with all the kids from university. And it was just an open house. And I remember David saying to Judy, Judy, let's go to bed. These youth, youth want to go home and sleep. And so that was our hint that it's enough is enough and we should go, leave them and go home. Uh, but it was just such a loving environment. Um, and maybe I'm reminiscing, and, but I, I get the feeling that the faith was a lot more personal in our life than it is for some young people now. Um, I remember going to, we were talking about teaching, uh, Arvid was talking about teaching in Australia, street teaching. It was quite common. We used to go to the Central Railway Station in Sydney and we even had teachers saying, I'm a Baha'i, ask me why. Um, and we used to go teaching on the streets. Um, and we had a lot of declarations. Most of them didn't stay because we didn't have the, way of accommodating them as we do now with the study circles but we had a lot of interest in the faith those days when i when i was talking to my two grandchildren the other day sabo and andy that when i was young and growing up in australia these were the people who accompanied us and i saw john is online now um you know, Dr. Khan, Dr. Janet Khan, John Walker, John Davis, and handled of course, Featherston. We used to have what we used to call youth institutes in Yerimbul in May, which was freezing cold. And we had these guys come there and, and accompany us for a whole week, teaching us how to do the different things. Um, remember, I handled the course, Featherston spent a week with us there about fear of God and gleanings. Um, Peter Khan told us about how to do public speaking. And so, um, these were all the people who were accompanied me as a young man to, to um, help me grow as a Baha'i. Who's the guy on the left? I had hair, for those of you who don't remember that far back, Ovid remembers. Um, and this was the Canberra Youth Conference. We were making signs to put around Canberra. And that's Helen Bloberg, which I actually saw today. She came to our celebration today. And I said, Helen, look at this photo. She, um, so this was in Canberra in 76, 77, I can't remember, it's very early. And some of these guys you would know, Shirley's in the front, there's Tom Price, Paul Bluer, Pfizer, Barbara Collins, Zaire, and that's um, Diane Bluer at the end. So these were, we used to hang around with these guys in Sydney as, as youth 
and get up to all sorts of mischief. And that's Shola. For those of you who don't remember that far back, that's what she looked like. Um, which, um, and that's young Roya. This was her first niece, I guess. So then came the family extension time. So Shola married Chris and, and has a son called Manny who's in Sydney. And he's a, unfortunately a copy of in, in character like me. And he surely blames me for all of Manny's shortcomings. Oops. Um, Faiz and I then met in Sydney in 76 and got married shortly after. And we've got two kids, um, Roya and Shara, and then three grandchildren. Um, I remember when we first came from Iran at one of the conferences, someone said to me, uh, someone said to my dad, because in Iran, I was always Dr. Fagani's son. So when we arrived here, someone said to dad, oh, you're Faiz's Faiz father. And he, I'm not sure if he liked it or not. And later on at the, one of the conferences before he passed away, someone said to me, oh, you're Roya's dad. And I could see dad smiling from face, to, from ear to ear saying, ha, that's how it feels like. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I guess that was it. But even now, one of the Iranian believers the other day said to me, oh, you are Dr. Fagani's son. I said, yes. And she said, it's a shame your Farsi is so bad. Yeah. So, <laughs> That is at the Sydney airport just, be, just before we left for Papua New Guinea. Um, that's when Faz and I went pioneer to Papua New Guinea. Um, and we were there four, it's four years and we had both kids there, both Saba, uh, Sharam and Roya were both born in Papua New Guinea. I guess this is a side of dad that most people didn't see. He was always very serious in Baha'i meetings, not known for his joviality or be able to joke. Um, and always with a tie and a, and a suit. And as a family, as a grandfather, um, well, this is Iroya, yeah, as a grandfather, he was different. He actually would get on his hands and knees and let Roya ride on his back like a horse. And once I remember complaining to him that, Dad, you never let us do that. Why are you then Iroya do that? Um, and he told me that grandchildren are more sweeter than children. Um, and he was right. Mum and dad then went to Haifa, as some of you know, and served at the World Center for 14 years in the research department. Um, they came back to Australia and dad continued to his last day of his life. He continued translating and mum typing the translations. Um, and in, um, he passed away in November 2012. So it's eight years now. And I remember the day he was in hospital. I used to go and see him every morning. And the doctor came and saw him and said, Dr. Fagani, today is your last day. You're going to pass away today. And dad smiled and he said, thank you. Um, and the nurse said, Dr. Fagani, you didn't understand. He said, you're going to die today. And dad says, no, I'm not. I'll make you transform me. And he was very happy. So, and they gave, he passed away in 24 hours and uh, in a very happy state of spiritual. Well, so it was, for me, it was really lovely to see that spirituality in him just before he passed, and his contentment, he was so happy. The House of Justice wrote very kindly to, to the National Assembly of Australia to saying that they were saddened at his, at, his, at his passing away and wishing the family uh, and ask, offering prayers or supplication at the House of Justice. Um, the last book he translated was the volume four of Revelation of Baha'u'llah by Adi Tahrir Zade into Farsi, which is not published, of course, after his passing. So that is the mom and dad with their first great grandchild, Saba, born in Brisbane. And that's mom, currently in a nursing home. She's 92, God bless her. Physically well, but dementia has got the better of her and she's got good days and bad days at the moment, but she's still alive and she, of Bikishu, and she talked to me the other day about how you encourage her to come to Australia. So she still remembers that far back. Some of the shorter memory is not as good, but she remembers. And they asked her, Mrs. Fagani, when did you come to Australia? And she said, oh, I think it was 50 years ago. It was such a good country those days. Now you're letting all these foreigners coming in. And I said, oh, mom, you're one of those foreigners. But anyway, <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, she's still well physically. And that's the last photo I've got of dad before he passed away. Um, in front of our house in Springfield Lakes in, in Queensland. So that's a brief history, I think, of the Faganis coming to Australia. And um, maybe I'll stop sharing now. Back to you, Graham. Oh, thank you for that very moving presentation. And I do wonder whether Shirley wants to add something about your recollections of arrival in Australia and your family life here. Oh, thank you, Graham. And thank you, Fajan. It was wonderful. I couldn't have done that. So thank you very much for, for doing that. And uh, I guess, you know, my recollections, besides all the things that Fahd said, I, to this day, I have no idea of the rules of rugby or cricket, even though Manny, my son, has played both of them. <laughs> and I've watched many games. I still don't know anything. But, uh, and, and yes, and English language. I remember many times Jane um, picking me up on whatever that I had learnt at school or whatever, telling me, do you really know what that word really means? And uh, I had used up, I had picked up some slang Australian word thinking it meant something that was quite okay and did not understand the roots of them. And Jane, if you're online, you helped me many times to recognize using the proper English word as opposed to the slang word. So yes, the Hassel family were very influential in uh, us getting Australianized properly. <laughs> so thank you for that. And that is probably what I remember. And, uh, you know, um, our time together with the uh, um, Price family and um, Yeganagis and Hesaramiris and, um, you know, lots of warmth, um, as far as said, uh, we all were like a family. Um, and I remember all those memories very dearly. Thank you very much, Graham, to um, facilitate this for us all. Thank you, Shirley, for that. Uh, wonderful to see you. And Jane is online and she was waving at you when you mentioned her. So. <laughs> I, I think that a lot of people remember your parents. Um, you know, um, Bahia's erudition. Uh, yes, he was a serious man, but he was a very learned guy and we learned a lot from him. Um, and I, I'm sure there are people online who have a recollection of uh, Bahia and Murray. Or of Forward, even. Or of no, no, no Forward. <laughs> Can I ask a question, Graham? Please go ahead. Uh, Far, do you know whether Dr. Fawani finished uh, volume four or uh, was he about to start it? What's, what's the ending point for volume four in, for Revelation? He finished and mum finished typing it and it was sent for, he finished proofreading it just two days before he passed away. So it, it was published after he was passed away. But it's published now. Volume 4, Revelation of Allah, is published in Farsi. Oh, it's published now. I didn't know that. Okay. Great. And uh, uh, Graham, something else. Uh, just a correction. Uh, I said the, te uh, the Chinese teaching uh, activity was in 70s, but it actually was in 80s, not 70s. Okay. Okay. Thanks. But Mama Yeganegi was very active in it. Absolutely. Uh, are there any other questions for Ford? Yes, Edwin, I do remember you becoming a Baha'i at your Um uh, Graham, I just wanted to uh, add and say that uh, you're right that Baha'i was a very learned and erudite man, but he also was very interested in youth. And my recollection is that there were two or three generations of youth that he would take through the dawn breakers, mm -hmm. through the gleanings and various tablets. And I was fortunate to be involved in one of those series. And uh, uh, he took meticulous care to uh, deepen young people on the writings. And he's unforgettable for that reason. Thank you, Avi. Uh, if there's no questions or comments. Uh, um, one question, uh, Graham, can I ask? Yes. Please um, I was on a Persian uh, public relation committee and there were some sort of um, articles against the phrase in papers and we asked uh, Dr. Bahar Farghani 
to answer those. And he was uh, so, so good in writing those sort of replies to such uh, accusations to the, to the faith. Thank you for that, thank you. Well, Fawad and Shulay, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, it's just wonderful to, to learn more of your family's background before they arrived in Australia and your experiences, uh, your impressions when you arrived. So that's been wonderful. And I'm going to move on to- One more thing before you go on. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, my earlier recollection of the, uh, it was that in Australia, we had a lot of strong women running, you know, were, in front of us as Baha'is, you know, we had Mama Yuganagi was just an enormous teacher. I mean, she was just an amazing teacher. Your mom, Judy, and uh, there was all these very prominent women in the, you know, who were role, role models for us as young people growing up to, to understand the position, their position in the faith. And um, yeah, so I remember learning from them all. And, and Farry Walker was right. We actually had fun. It was the Baha'i community was fun. Uh, we, we enjoyed being Baha'is and doing things, serving the faith. It was just enormous fun. Thank you. Thank you. So true. Uh, time to move to your cousins. Uh, so uh, the Hesera Miri family uh, were in Sydney. And uh, Fahime is going to make a presentation. Fahime Kingston now has been in Australia for uh, nearly 50 years. And she and Eric have been members of various Baha'i communities in Victoria, New South Wales, and overseas. And they now live uh, at, uh, at Jeringong, New South Wales. Uh, Fahime, thanks for joining us tonight. Eric as well. And uh, let's uh, uh, turn over to you and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Graham. I'm not going to be as good as the two previous speakers. So I probably read most of my material and after I've finished, Eric will be showing some photographs of the, of the family. Thank you. Um, my mother, Ferdosie Hesar Amiri, was born in 1925, and my father, Nusratullah Hesar Amiri, was born in 1980. They met through a relative and they were married around 1948. They both have interesting backgrounds, history, family history. My paternal grandfather, his name was Ali Askar Lor. Um, he lived in a small village outside of Tehran, and he became a Baha'i at the age of 15. Once he became a Baha'i, he had to um, run away or flee from the village and move to Tehran because he knew that uh, his family would kill him uh, because he had become a Baha'i. And he changed his surname from Lor to um, Hisar Amiri. And as far as I know, he never back, went back to the village. Um, years later, he and another Baha'i friend, a Mr. Tehrani, traveled to Haifa for many months, and they arrived at Nuruz 1909 uh, on the day that the body of the Bab was being interred by Abdul Baha. So he had the bounty to be part of the ceremony there. Um, he and my grandmother had two sons, and my uncle and my dad, and unfortunately, they both have passed away. Uh, my grandfather also passed away long before I was born, so I never had the uh, opportunity to meet him. Uh, my mother's family um, goes all the way back to the time of the Bab. In 1850, after the, uh, after the Bab and his compa companion, um, Janab Zanuzi, were executed in Tabriz, and the authorities threw the bodies in a moat outside of the Tabriz. A devoted believer um, rescued the, the remains, took them to a silk factory in, uh, in outside of Tabriz, which actually belonged to my mother's ancestors, the Milani family. And the bodies remained there for one night until the next day they were placed in a coffin, in a casket, and they were moved to a um, safe place. Uh, my mother and her, and her two sisters were born in Ishqabad in the early 20th, 20th century. Uh, her father, Agha Ghulam Ahmadov, they actually, he actually changed his uh, surname from Milani to Ahmadov for the purpose of being able to do business in Ishqabad. And his five brothers had a carpet factory and they were well, well to do. Unfortunately, my grandmother, Sadiqa, um, became ill with the flu 
and the doctor gave him uh, the medication sure. for the and the doctor gave her the medication for uh, for malaria and that unfortunately uh, killed her. So my grandfather and my great grandmother became responsible full time carers of the three younger young girls. My mom was six years old at the time. Um, in the mid 1930s, during time of Stalin. Uh, a very strong opposition developed uh, against the Baha'is. Many homes, including that of my grandparents, were confiscated by, uh, for the military use. And many Baha'is, including two of my mother's uncle, uncles and several cousins, were exiled to Siberia. My grandfather was put in prison, and my mother, her two sisters, and with their grandmother, they were, and, and many other Baha'i friends, uh, they were uh, forced to return to Iran. After seven years, my grandfather lost his sight in prison. He was then released to the care of a relative, and unfortunately, he passed away several months after that. So my mother and, the, and my two aunts never saw their father again. And when, um, the girls and my great grandmother moved to Iran. They had to change the surname again from Ahmadov to Asbati. I can just interrupt. The story of uh, this man, the persecution, and the girls is actually in chapter seven of this book, Years of Silence, that reports the, the downfall of the Ishkabad Baha'i community under the Soviet regime. Thank you. Uh, my parents were active members of our community in Tehran, and later when we moved to a community outside of Tehran, my father was an active teacher of the faith and conducted firesides in a number of um, very high, very rough fanatical neighborhoods in Tehran. I remember him telling us that in one of these areas um, to which he traveled to, uh, to give firesides, one of the Baha'is living in, the, in that particular area, who was a butcher and had two very strong sons, would send them to meet my father at the bus stop, take him back to their place for the firesides. And after the firesides, these two boys would take my father back to the bus, made sure that he got on the bus and then bus moved on before these two boys went back to their home. Um, for a number of years before we left, before leaving Iran, my father spoke about wanting to leave Iran. I think he was anxious that um, his children should have a better life and hopefully free of prejudice, which we faced constantly at school, my father at his workplace, and, um, on, and where we lived in our neighborhoods. Um, I think it was around 1969, 1970, as always said, and also far, that Vicky came to visit um, her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Mujgani in Tehran. And my parents um, knew Mr. And, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Mujgani really well. So they went to visit Vicky. And I think it was there that Vicky encouraged my uh, parents to move to Australia, to emigrate to Australia. And, um, we were extremely lucky that uh, both Vicky and uh, Mr. Um, Hidayat Garnegi were prepared to sponsor us um, for, for, the, for the immigration purposes. So it didn't take us very long to, um, to get our visas. Uh, I think it was about six months after we uh, fulfilled all the requirements that our immigration visa arrived. So um, once in mid-1970, once I finished high school, we managed to sell our home. My father gave up his job as an accountant for the Department of Agriculture. And uh, we packed our belongings and, and on the 8th of November, 19, on the 8th of November, 1970, uh, we left Tehran. We flew uh, from Tehran to uh, Delhi, one night in Delhi and then um, to Sydney. Uh, in Australia, and we arrived on the um, November 10, 1970. Uh, and we settled in right the high community. And I think that, uh, I hope Vicky will be able to um, correct me if I'm wrong, that we were the first Baha'i family coming directly from Iran to Sydney. I'm not too sure. I hope she'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong. And of course, quickly followed by the other families. By now, the 
those restrictions of the white Australia policy, you know, were no longer causing problems for the Iranians to arrive. Sponsorship was sufficient and therefore it was quick, pretty quick that they could get their visa. So our family is always very grateful to the Yaganagi family, the Baha'i community in Rai, and the greater city Baha'i community for their support and kindness. They, were very, they made us very, very welcome. Uh, my dad was very happy to be out of Iran, and on many occasions he said he'll never ever go back, and he never did. Uh, my mom was homesick for a number of years until the uh, revolution in 1979, and I think she realized how lucky she was that she, uh, she had been out of Iran, and she, so she settled down um, to life in Australia. Uh, my parents and I spent our first year in Australia attending English classes, which was uh, provided by the immigration department. Uh, my brother, Fruzan, was five years old at the time, started primary school. Um, uh, and uh, after, uh, and uh, my sister, Faize, um went to the third year of high school. Um, after my parents completed their English courses, my dad was employed by Volkswagen uh, in their factory in Lane Cove as a storeman, and my mom uh, worked in one of the factories making uh, electrical components uh, for computers. Uh, I applied to do a pharmacy course at the University of Sydney, and while I was waiting to get, uh, to get a reply, I also worked uh, in several factories doing um, summer, summer, uh, summer work. Uh, my, my sister Pfizer remembers that when she started high school that she actually came across prejudice from the white Australian students. So she was quite happy to befriend the, uh, the uh, migrant, the students from migrant background and uh, she never looked back. Um, after she finished um, school, uh, high school, she went to um, Canberra to university, and from there she worked for the Australian government for a number of years, until in 1989 she moved to USA. Uh, she's retired now, and she's lucky enough to be able to divide her time between Canada and Australia. Um, and uh, my brother actually finished, uh, once she, she, uh, he finished uh, his uh, high school course, he went to Wollongong University, and. Uh, did a computer science course, and uh, he and his uh, family are living in, uh, in Sydney now. Um, for myself, I was accepted to Sydney University to do the pharmacy course, but unfortunately, my English was not up to standard, and so I found the course material very difficult to cope with. So after a year and a half, I deferred my course, um, hoping to go back and do something else later on, so I did a year of secretarial course just to improve my English, and I was lucky enough to um, be able to get a job at the New South Wales University in 1974. It was about that time that um, I also met uh, a long-haired young man from Queensland who had, become, who had become interested in the faith. He was studying at the University of New South Wales. He also became interested in the faith um, coming to Firesides at Judy and David Hassels, along with another young Baha'i, Alan Waters. So, um, so we, we really had very nice time as uh, Fahad said, uh, Judy and David really did uh, support the youth activities uh, in the 70s and the 80s. So once Eric uh, became a Baha'i, he became more involved in the, in, in the activities and we, uh, we started getting to know each other and uh, um, he was for, unfortunate enough to ask me to marry him, in, and we got married no, in 1970. <laughs> no, we, we married in 19, January 1976. So we have three children, our two sons, Naeem and Riaz, live in Melbourne, and our daughter, Seema, lives in um, Sydney. Uh, in 1972, 1973, Dr. Bahar Fogani and family, as far as said, arrived in Australia, and Dr. Forani and my mom were cousins. Now, if you, you could speak Farsi, it would, very, it would be very easy to, to sort of give the relationship, but um, their, their, their mothers were sisters. Um, around 1977, 1978, 
Uh, my parents uh, purchased a house in, uh, in Epping, which was part of the Parramatta uh, municipality, and um, they both became members of the local assembly. Now, I'm not too sure if it was the first local assembly in Parramatta or whether it had lapsed before and it was being reformed. Um, so, and they were both active members of the community for many years until my father became seriously ill in 1990, and then they had to limit their, uh, their participation. Unfortunately, my father passed away in January 1998. Uh, my mother lived in that house for a couple of more years and then uh, sold the house and moved to Huntley Baha'i community. And then she, unfortunately, she passed away in October 2018. Um, our Baha'i life in Sydney was great. We really enjoyed going to the house of worship regularly for cleaning. That was when the Baha'i communities were rostered um, to, to go and help uh, with the cleaning inside the house of, uh, inside the house of uh, the temple worship and also uh, with the gardening outside. And uh, also my father did um, guiding at the house of worship for many years traveling by bus every Friday, spending the whole day there, and then traveling back. Um, my sister and I enjoyed the company of many youth, Baha'i youth, and became good friends, and I still keep in touch with a number of them. Um, as also Farad mentioned, and also Avid, I think that uh, I really would like to take the opportunity of saying that I remember with great fondness, and I'm very grateful for the Saturday night uh, gatherings that Judy and David Hassel hosted in their home in Randwick, which was, which was just down the road from the university. And I also participated in camps at Yerembo um, when they had the, uh, the chicken coops. And uh, summertime, it used to be absolutely um, sweltering in the hot, and in wintertime, it used to be freezing cold. And we all, I also enjoyed the, uh, going on the teaching trips with the youth. Uh, of the 70s um, around New South Wales. So friends, this is my, my presentation, a brief family history. Thank you very much for your attention. Now Fahim has asked me if I could show some slides, uh, some photographs. We've got a few here, Graham. So I'll just bring up and share screen. If you just confirm that you can see them once I've got them up. Thanks, Eric. It's, it's looking good. They're up there. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, this wasn't a family that took lots of photographs and certainly, you know, before they came to Australia, we, we found very few photographs. But goodness me, that's about 30 years ago now. That's um, Nasrat and Fedos from about 1990. So many people who do remember them will sort of remember them from that stage, apart from those that knew them when they were, were younger. We found we've got He's changed one, only one photograph of Notzrat's father towards the you know, latter part of his life, the gentleman who happened to walk into Haifa on the day that the Barb's buried was being placed, in, Barb's body was being placed in the shrine. And in the case of Fedos's father and the mother, this is her, her father, Gulam and Sedigay, mother here in the early 1920s, so from the days when the, the um, Eshkabad Baha'i community was, was doing well, but as you heard, things went terribly wrong after this. Very few photographs of, uh, from, from Iran, but we did, we did come across one here of Nasrat on the teaching committee of Tehran about 1959. Um, for those of you that know some other members of the family, he looks very familiar, doesn't he? Uh, look, I was going to say, uh, make, Furzan, please get ready, uh, because we'd love to see you a bit later. <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. Okay. Um, and uh, when they got to Australia, I think I've got to say this is about the only photograph I can find of all five of them. And it's a very furry, blurry photograph taken on the steps of the House of Worship. And we figure it was about 1971, probably within months of them arriving here. So there's the family of Fedos and Nostrak with Fahime, uh, Furusan, and, and, and Fose at that time. And Fahime and Fose were some of the Sydney youth from about 1974. You know who you are. But by that stage, you see that the, uh, the Badian family and the Forgali family are, are there actively as, as part of the, the group of Baha'is in the Sydney area. And within a few more years, even more troublemakers got involved with the whole lot. So here's for him and for Jose with a bunch of uh, layabouts with long hair. 
Oh, for him and Eric, travel teaching in regional New South Wales, about 75. Now, I have to register my sincere thanks to Nosrat and, and Fedos for making that decision. And Vicky, thank you for encouraging them, because I benefited from it greatly with uh, Fahima arriving in Australia and us getting together and building the married life that we've had. Is um, uh, Fahime in um, Randwick, members of the Randwick community, just some of the members of the community, but some very familiar faces around it. There's our resident auxiliary board member, David Hassel, joining us in. I remember Fahime was on the assembly. I wasn't, I wasn't even 21. Here's a photograph from the 1990s. So with Fahime's children, our children, Seema and Naeem sitting in the tree, Riaz in the front. Now we mentioned that um, Farazan got his degree and here he is with his wife, Satu, graduating in 1994. And now he is fed off with uh, Farazan and Satu's oldest daughter, Bahir, in 1996. And the last photograph we have shows uh, Fedos just a couple of years ago with her three granddaughters, Layla and Bahir on the left and Seema on the right. And so the family is you know, firmly embedded now you know, within Australia, within Australian society. And um, we actually have grandchildren beyond that who have now got Chinese heritage also in them. So that's the end of the photographs then. I will just stop sharing and I believe then for him, that's uh, the end of your presentation. Yes, yes it is. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Fahime and Eric, for that presentation. Uh, Furazan, do you want to come online and just say hi in the question for this presentation? Hi, everyone. It's uh, Furazan and Satu here. Um, so these days we live in Beecroft in Sydney, and um, we're part of the part of the Parramatta community. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Furuzan. Lovely to see you. <laughs> did our Fahima leave out all of the service that she did? <laughs> was like secretary of Knox Community for like two decades, and then she and Eric were you know, um, serving here in the national office when Eric was uh, the secretary and, and then they were in Haifa for five years. My God, you know, Fahim, there's a lot, a lot more to your story. <laughs> Adi, thanks for the photos. What a, what a contrast. <laughs> um, I'd like to remember, I think, you know, Nostrat and, and Ferdos's yeah. contribution to the communities that were stalwarts. For, and, Nostrat in particular. I mean, the thing to realise is very capable people came without the language. I mean, he was a well-qualified accountant and he worked as a storeman. That's all he could do for the rest of his life. But, you know, his dedication to guiding at the house of worship, even as he was getting ill, he would still get on that bus and travel up and spend the whole day uh, guiding at the house of worship. And uh, they're very supportive of the communities that they were in. Well, once I, again, I think you missed to say that your dad was a scholar, a Baha'i scholar, and uh, was well versed in the writings of the faith. He was. He was. He was very much so. <laughs> Thank you, Hamid. Are there any other uh, final comments before we bring the session to a close? If not, uh, look at. Uh, uh, yes. something? Ruhi. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I have a good memory uh, from Mr. Dr. Forgani from Haifa. He was uh, take us from uh, Haifa to Sharon of Baha'u'llah many times. And I have a beautiful writing from him. Uh, send it to me and I keep it for myself. And for Mrs. Uh, Hesar Amiri, we miss her so much because almost every day we saw her in the our estate because we are neighbor. Uh, very good memory. Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, friends, we come to the end of our evening. I'd like to thank all the uh, uh, um, presenters tonight. Uh, for these presentations and thank you all for coming online.
and uh, we will close this session now. We look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, Graham.